I'm Stephen Ben Denoon, and you're watching Denoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com here in Jerusalem. We are, had the privilege, me and my wife, my father-in-law, and our children there had a privilege of meeting a Christian group from Nashville, Tennessee this afternoon. Uh, they were looking, they had just got into Jerusalem, and they were out walking around looking to try to find their way to Jaffa Gate. Wanted to go into the old city and uh, don't even know why, but I, I think I know why now after getting a chance to meet them and speak with them. Uh, but when we were inside a little store there, they came in looking for a map. And the one brother that was with them, young man by the name of John, easy enough to remember his name because that was my late brother's name, was John as well. And so it was easy to remember his name. Uh, but the group was mostly girls, so uh, there was another brother with them as well. And of course, one really precious sister that was from Alabama. Of course, you guys know I'd have to say that because uh, that's home for me. Uh, but anyway, she's from Auburn, Alabama, so it made it even better. I was glad to know she wasn't an Alabama fan, so for all my friends that are Alabama fran fans, I'm sorry to tell you guys that. Anyway, though, it was a real blessing to talk to them. My wife was talking to one part of the group when we stopped up there at Joppa Gate, and, and, and I had the privilege of talking to another part of the group there. And... Uh, we got on the subject, though, of the fall in the garden and what happened and, and what is really written in the book, in the Bible itself. My wife, with the other group, uh, not knowing what I was talking about, got into the writings of Paul and what Paul really wrote in the scriptures. And so I got to thinking about this uh, this afternoon because my wife had asked me, she said, you know, you need to, to, to work on a message uh, for the people. And I know there's many newcomers all the time to the ministry that have not heard a lot of the videos. There's hundreds of them out there. And, uh, and if you were to try to go and find some of these teachings, it's like finding a needle in a haystack because I may speak on one subject and it's a long time before I ever come back to it again. So I thought I would kind of highlight some of what we talked with them tonight about, some of what my wife talked about, and just kind of put a little bit together for them so if they happen to go back and look at this on YouTube, it'll make it easier for them to find. I just want to say to you guys, God bless you. You really were a blessing for us as well. And we just pray God's speed be with you, uh, especially for the rest of your journey, that it's a safe journey and that you go back home just filled more with the Spirit of God than, than when you actually started your journey out. So anyway, let's start right off. I, I like to call this the redemption process, especially because for my own people, it is a redemption process. Uh, although it does touch a lot of the fact that God created both man and women equal. He did not create us uh, one species to rule over the other. I say species, I know we're the humankind, but nonetheless, sometimes this seems, the way that, it seems to be the way that women are treated, as if there's some lesser species, and that's not true. God created Adam and Eve equally in the beginning. In fact, in the Torah, a lot of the rabbinical scholars teach that she's treated, she was created with more deliberation and a greater blessing. But nonetheless, let's take a look at what the Word says here. One of the things that I find very interesting about the teaching here uh, in the beginning when God first created um, Adam, and really you have to think about this, Adam represents more mankind. And the reason I say that is because God says something in specifically here. Let me just read to you uh, from Genesis chapter 2. It says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, verse 4, and when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no plant of the field was yet on the earth, and no herb of the field and it had yet grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed in his, into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, let me just share with you something here from, as Jewish people, when we read this from the Hebrew language here. Um, and this is in Bereshit. Uh, the chapter is Bet. And of course the verb is Zayin. Or excuse me, the verse is Zayin. 
Um, ויותר יה, uh, uh, אדוני אלוהים את האדם עפר מן האדמה, so God is creating uh, the man is from the, the, the earth, the ground of the earth, ויפח באפאיו נשמר חיים. He breathes into his nostrils. It's more than what you see in the English language. It is breath. He's breathing in his nostrils a breath, but the life is God's own life. This is Hashem's life. We know this because the chai, as we'd say singular, is the word we use for life, which is derived also from the beginning of the, the, beginning of, uh, the, or the, the second letter in the word chai. The yod represents God's name. The ya in God's name, the very beginning of it. Chaim is a plural form of the life of God being breathed into this body. Now, interestingly enough, then he says here, uh, Adam le nefesh chaya. The man becomes a living being or a living soul. Now it's singular and it applies to Adam as a separate being. But inside of him is breathed the life of God in a plural form. Why? We see later that what God does, God takes and he puts Adam into a deep sleep. And when he does, he opens up his side. It's the first surgery that's ever performed on the earth. In fact, in Hebrew, the very word where he says when he puts him into a deep sleep is the same word we use in modern Hebrew here as a coma. He places him into, that, into like a coma state. You know, you have to kind of wonder if God has to place Adam into like a comatose state to be able to open up his side. Can't, it, there's no way it would have been a painless surgery then. So he puts him into a deep sleep, just like a doctor today puts someone into a deep sleep to do a surgery, especially on the abdomen area, you normally always put into a deep sleep. And so he was placed into that deep sleep, and it literally, in the Hebrew, it says, God taken from min ish, min ish, the word ish was used for the word man before Adam was. God called him ish, and he called the woman isha. Eve was not called Eve in the beginning. Chava in Hebrew is how we say Eve. It was, she was not called Chava, she was called Isha. Now, ironically, both these names, Ish and Isha, is derived from a compound word in Hebrew, which means fire, Ish, and the divine letter, the Yod. In the case of the man's name, Ish, it's Aleph Yod Shin. Now, the Yod is in the middle of his name. You'd have Aleph, the Yod, and then the Shin. The yod right here in the middle, you take that down, it's like a little, little hook letter, it comes, you take that out, that's the first letter of the divine name of God. Now if you take God out of there, the yod out of there, you have Aleph and Sheen left, which is the word Aish, which is fire. Now ironically, Isha is spelled similarly. It's Aleph, Sheen, Hey. Now the Aleph and the Sheen, again, is fire. The last letter in her name, the He, which is the feminine part of the word Aish, or the feminine part of the word fire, you take that He and you bring it over with the Yod, now you have Ya. You actually begin to form God's name, His very divine name. And a lot of rabbinical scholars have brought out that if you take the Yod and the He out, you've removed God from the marriage, so to speak, now you have a consuming fire. But what really was it? Why did God say that his name was Ish and her name was Isha? Because when God breathed that breath of life in them, he was breathing in what is known in the Christian world as the Holy Spirit. God's own spirit had been breathed into their bodies and they were living souls. In other words, they were human beings that were filled with the life of God. That's what made them eternal beings, was God's own life. Now the fall comes into the garden. We know that Satan deceives Eve and when he does, they partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and sin comes in. Now Eve is deceived into this. She's not really understanding what's going on. And of course Satan comes in quoting the Bible to her. And she's, he says to her, you know, God has said you can eat any, of any of the trees that you want. 
And she said, yes, but he said, you can't eat or even touch the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Now, a lot of rabbis condemn me, even said that she said words in there that were not actually spoken. But see, that's not true. Because had that been true, had Eve added to the word of God, then God would have been obligated to correct her for that as well. But God doesn't do that. When God comes down to find out what actually happened in the Garden of Eden, he's asking those questions. He asks the question, he comes to Adam first, and he says, who told you you were naked? Because he hides himself. We know the story. He hides himself from God, and, and God comes to him, and he says, uh, he says, you know, why were you hiding? And, and just paraphrasing here for the sake of time. And, and Adam says, because I was naked. We were, we were naked. And God knew that they could not know that unless they had partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God said to Adam, who told you that you were naked? And Adam, fearful, he passed the buck, so to speak. And he says, the woman you gave me, she did it. And so God turns to Eve. And she says, what have you done? Or he says, what have you done? And she said, the serpent beguiled me. He tricked her into something. He deceived her, in other words. Now, at that point, now God turns to the serpent because Eve was honest. Nowhere do we see any place where God ever corrects Eve for adding to his word or saying something that God did not say. It's assumed that she did that because it's assumed that God only talked to Adam. But we're going to find out when God actually says what's going to happen to Adam and Eve, when he prophesies their fate, we find out that she had her own relationship with God out of God's own mouth regarding this matter. And this is important because the reason I say that, there's so much scrupled up teaching in the Word of God as, to, as, as far as what happened in the Garden of Eden. And it's important that we get this right because Women are still oppressed today, and they shouldn't be oppressed. And the teachings are still false. And more importantly, Israel, they're my own people. We need it to know what, how redemption is to be restored. Because clearly, if, we, if partaking of the tree of life gave eternal life, then we must get back that eternal life in order to live forever. And the question is, is how do we get back to the Eitz Chaim? And that was a question that was asked 2,000 years ago. And the reason we know that question was there is because when Yeshua was here, he actually says, I am that way. I am the truth, and I am the life. He answers the question that was amongst the, 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 the rabbinical teachers of that day. Because he wouldn't have answered it if it wasn't a question. So he says that he's the way. And of course we find out that after the fall comes in, God puts the, the angels there to guard the way. Or actually in the Hebrew word, to preserve the way of the tree of life. God said, lest they put forth their hand and, and partake and they live forever. Now see, God had already given a commandment for Adam and Eve to repopulate the earth. So our, their children came forth as we are descendants down through that timeline of the descendants of Adam and Eve. But the problem is, as the children were born, they were never able to partake of the tree of life. Now, another point, too, to make about the tree of life. The tree of life, God said, lest they put forth their hand and partake and live forever. But if you'll notice, they never put forth their hand to partake in the first place. God gave that gift or that fruit himself freely of his own choosing. There was no works whatsoever involved in that. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil required works. And this is another reason why God had to preserve that way. Now, isn't it ironic that in Yeshua's life, that in his own life, it is a no works zero works, um, restoration. Even Abraham, God was showing a type with our father Abraham that he merited God's favor 
without works. It was an unconditional covenant. All right, now let's take a look. Let's go to where the fall has actually occurred. And the Lord God said to the woman, this is in verse 13 in chapter 3, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shall be thy meat. Excuse me, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, a lot of times, this is another argument that, that I have to defend the word of God. And that is, many times they say a woman does not have a seed. God clearly says she does. But it's not the way we think, and that's where the trouble comes in. Her seed is faith. Faith in his word will produce that child, will reproduce the Adam, the second Adam, that would allow the restoration of life. Now, let's go on. It shall bruise his head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, now see, you have to remember, if Eve was in error by Adding to the word, as some of my brethren, my rabbinical brethren have taught, then God would be required to bring the charge against her. And the reason the charge would have to be brought, because there has to be the time to be able to repent of what your sin is. So therefore, if you've sinned, God is gracious enough to allow us a time and a space to repent. But God doesn't point out that sin in her. So therefore, it couldn't have been a sin. So let's see what he says here. I will greatly multiply the pain of thy childbearing. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And yet thy desire shall be, on, be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now this is where a great mistake is made with a lot of teachers. That it's God has given the man a divine decree that he now can rule over his wife. Totally contrary to the word of God. God is actually prophesying of what's going to happen as a result of the fall. Now, let's just look at that to, 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 to make it a little bit more clearer. When you come over here in the, um, let me get over here in the Hebrew version of this. El ha'isha omer chadeber araba. We come over here. Let's see. The only reason he rules over her is because he's lost the Spirit of God. He's become carnal because there's no more, the life that was there is taken away. And so therefore, in a carnal state, he rules over his wife because he's bigger. In fact, when it says here about the children, we get over here in verse 16 when he says to the woman, he says, Teledebanim. We translate that as children, but technically God says you will birth sons. So the sorrow and the pain actually is prophetic as well. Because God knows that one is going to rise up and kill the other eventually. And so therefore, in a prophetic sense, the sorrow and pain is what Eve will suffer as a result of one son raising up Cain, who would kill his brother Abel. So we begin to get a totally different picture here, totally different picture of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Not a picture that a woman now is to be a doormat as in many societies around the world they have made but totally opposite of that in fact when you go into the uh, Christian writings and you look at the teachings of Paul even in the teachings of Yahshua we find that even historically speaking 
people think a lot of times, like for example of Paul, that he was a woman hater. And it's mainly because of the mistranslations of, the, of his own writings. For example, when he says, I suffer not a woman to teach or to, to usurp authority over a man, he never said that. If you look at the original Greek, he actually suffer, says, I suffer not that woman to teach. There was a woman that was in that time that was spreading the doctrine of Diana, that women were the great ones and men were the inferior ones. And when Paul was dealing with the circumstance, because you have to remember in Paul, you're reading a letter that he writes in regards to a question that is asked him. And history even points out that there was a woman that was teaching the doctrine of Diana. And so Paul comes in, and when you read the original Greek and the Koine Greek language, we find out that he says, I suffer not that woman to teach, nor to assert authority over a man, but to remain in silence. Many other things that he says, such as kephale, the word for head, when it says that man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of man. And in English, we take the word head, and we think of that as being authority. That's the English language. But in Koine Greek, it's not so. It really means the source of. So when we look at the word kephale, when God says in there that uh, man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of the man and God is the head of Christ, what is he saying? They're the source of. And it really makes sense, especially when you begin to bring it into context of redemption. Because we find out that God himself is the creator. He is the source of mankind. In this case here, when we look at Yahshua as being Mashiach, we find out that he is the source, he is the creator of the Messiah. And of course, we also know that it was Mashiach who was the one that breathed the breath of life into the very body of Adam. He is the source of Adam. And where did Eve come from? She come from within inside that body of Adam. So therefore, the man, or Adam, is the source of the woman. Now ironically though, when you look at it, and God says that he taken uh, Isha from the man, it doesn't use the word Adam. It actually says in Hebrew, min ish. That was the word that was used that's actually the fire of God. When you take the compounded words in there, the letters that make the compounded word in there, it would be like saying that God taken Eve from the fire of Hashem. He took and he pulled Eve out. See, now it makes it altogether different. This is why. This is why she comes filled with the Holy Spirit from the very womb, as it were, from the womb of her husband. Now let's quickly take a look at redemption because I know it's late and I don't want to keep you guys super long. I mean, we can go into this really deep and there's a lot of places where we've taught these things. But let's take a look, though, of the restoration. And we can go into all the different writings of Paul and many other ones that are controversial and you're going to find out that the reason why the things that Paul wrote are translated the way they are is because they have tried to keep a patriarchal system going all these years. They've tried to silence women. But ironically, we have, in, even in the Jewish Bible, which is what I use, a, I use a Hebrew Bible, we have the book of Ruth. You know, and it doesn't say who the author is, but, you know, we have the book of Esther. We have a woman judge. We have uh, the case of uh, the daughters there that come to Moses and because their father had died and he had no sons, they said, you know, what about, do we not have a right to be able to, to, to get an inheritance of our father? And God says to hearken to him. Isn't it funny also that Moses himself, it's another interesting thing about Moses I've always thought was fascinating. Moses, when he actually goes, he flees Egypt, he goes to Midian, now, the movie always portrays Moses as when he gets there, he's about half dead. I, I can't agree with that because, one, by himself, he fights off the shepherds and he helps Zipporah and her, her sisters to water the flock, water, give them water and the water for their flocks. I believe he knew very well, as smart as he was, he knew that trade route well. 
he knew where he was going to flee away from, from Egypt. Now, whether or not he had intended to go to Midian or not, I have no idea, but that's where he ended up at when all this story here happens. But isn't it interesting, though, that here that we have women that are shepherds. Isn't it odd God always talks about the shepherds of the flock and types that as those that feed and lead the children of Israel? And we have, in the case of Zipporah, these other shepherds, the wicked shepherds, were always beating the women back and driving them back and moving their flocks up to be watered first, as if they were greater or something. And when Moses comes along and sees that the women are being belittled because they are women, he takes a stand for them. And he beats back the false shepherds. And he brings them up so that their, water, their flocks can be watered. Isn't that interesting, though, that Yahshua does very similar? You ever notice the first person to ever bring a message about the resurrection was a woman? And the apostles didn't believe her. Why? They had came up in a patriarchal system as well, so it was still kind of difficult. As much as they had saw that he basically broke every tradition that we had, like the woman at the well when his disciples come back and he's there talking to a woman, you know, that was something not customary at all to be doing. But when he sent Mary to go tell his disciples that he had risen, and they didn't believe it because it was a testimony of a woman. Yeshua, when he come in their presence, he abraded them for their unbelief. Because they didn't believe it because it come from a woman. See, it's interesting how God takes up for women. All through the scripture. Look at Esther. The, the stance that Esther took. What man... I mean, Mordecai, God bless him. I mean, Mordecai comes and he lays at the gate. But it was Esther. Upon the pain of death, risked her own life to save her people. That's why we have the holiday Yom Purim. But anyway, though, let's get back to the redemption process itself. If the tree of life was cut off, God guarded that way. That's where our eternal life is. When we really want to know where eternal life is, it's Eitz Chaim in the Garden of Eden. This is what we have to figure out as Jewish people and as even Gentiles. How do we partake of the tree of life according to God's way? Nowhere can we find in the scripture where Adam and Eve partook of it, God gave it. So it has to be a free gift. And there has to be a way for us to partake of that in order to live eternally. Otherwise, we're doomed. We can read all the prophecies that God promised to regather our people back in Israel. We're here. Many of us are here. Many of the tribes are still not back here yet. But yet the promise is that they will be back. We also read that the world will turn against us. We have all these different prophecies. But the most important prophecy to be fulfilled is the redemption of Israel. And you know, Daniel clearly says that it will bring an end of sin. Not just a sacrifice offered for our sins, it brings an end to sins, end of iniquities. This is what redemption is supposed to do. Now the only way we can bring an end to all of these things in our life, all of our iniquities, our sins, and to be no more, is to get the same kind of life that Adam and Eve had at the beginning that would give us the ability to live a life that is moved and directed by God Himself. So we have to begin to search out then is where, where, how do we get back to the Eitz Chaim? How do we get back to that tree of life? Now ironically, when we look at the life of Yeshua, when he came on this earth, so many things that he did, so many things that he said, they were to get the, the attention of the Jewish people. He came to his own, clearly. His life is hidden in the story of Joseph. It's hidden in the story of David. I mean, it's just everywhere. 
And it's ironic. I, I teach on many of these, these scenarios, especially David and, and, and Joseph. A lot of people teach on Joseph, but not as many teach about David and, and the similarities that are there. It is just unbelievable how many that are there. But in simplicity, one of the things that really struck in my mind is when he met the woman at the well. And he says to her, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, You'd ask me for a drink of water, and I'd give you water that you don't have to come to this well anymore. Now, they were getting to a little bit of an of a ecclesiastical debate, we might say. She says, sir, the well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. And she talked about, you know, you Jews say that we worship God in, in, in Jerusalem, and we say that our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But really, the debate comes down really simple, is when he talks about that water. Now, Yeshua says something interesting. He says to her, go get your husband and come here. She says, I've had, I have no husband. He said, you told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. That struck a chord in her heart. And she said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, for we know that when the Messiah, when Mashiach comes, he'll do the same thing. Now, how did she know that Mashiach would know the secret of the heart? It's because of the story of Abraham. Abraham, you'd say in English, Abraham. What is it about Abraham? Well, we read in the, the Torah that there were three messengers that come down to Abraham. Melech. Melechim, actually. Three, three messengers. Now, I know that there's a lot of circles that teach, well, that is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. No, it's not that. It doesn't identify, but only one of them. When Moses, when Moshe himself writes about these three here, there's one that he identifies by name, and he calls that one Hashem. Now, for those of you guys that are listening that have not heard me teach on this before, especially the friends that we got to meet here uh, tonight, Hashem, in case you do not know, is God, it's the way as Jewish we say Hashem for God's divine name. It's the letters, the, uh, the yod He vav He in Hebrew. Because we know that God gave a commandment, do not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. So if we can't say it properly, it is better to say Hashem, which in Hebrew means the name, than to try to pronounce it. Because we don't want to break the commandment of God, and this is why we do that. So anyway, Moses said the one that actually told Abraham, the very secret that was in Sarah's heart, he called him Hashem. That was God himself in a human body. Now this is why Tovia Singer, Rabbi Tovia Singer, is a, a, a friend of mine. And we've been corresponding back and forth a little bit more here recently because we kicked around the idea of doing a public debate. Um, but I have a lot of respect for him. He's my brother and, and he considers me his brother as well, although we know we differ in a lot of areas. But Rabbi Tovia always makes the comment that May, uh, God cannot become a man. Now, I know the scripture he takes where God says he's not a man, that you could reason with him. It doesn't say that he could not become a man. It just says God is not a man that you reason with him. In other words, he's not like we are. But clearly, Moses wrote to us and said that God came down in a human body and he had to be a human body. It's not just a, uh, some kind of uh, imagination or something like that. Because clearly Abraham took and had a kid killed, a little calf killed. And his wife made the bread. And he ate the flesh of this little lamb and drank the milk. The scripture plainly says it. So he can't get around it. Hashem himself became a man for the purpose to come and meet Abraham. Now, but the key in here, though, is that he knew the secrets of Abraham's heart as well as Sarah's heart. When she laughed within herself and said, how could this be? Me being an old woman, have pleasure with my Lord again. So see, this is why the Samaritan woman knew what the Messiah would do. No doubt it had to have been taught that this one that came, you know, that Moses wrote that it was actually God himself, this is how God would bring Mashiach, the anointed, the anointed prince of God. He would have to come like a man, which we do know. I mean, all rabbis agree that Mashiach is a man. 
It's just many of them do not believe that Mashiach would be God in a man. But that's the very point that I see. Now, he says to the woman, here's a key point. If you knew who it was it was talking to, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you water. You don't come here anymore. Yahshua was giving her a sign. What is that sign he's giving her? The sign that he's trying to get her to see is something that happened in the wilderness journey. When Moses came out and he brought the children of Israel with him during the Exodus event, now this happens twice. Sometimes we don't realize that because we always think about where God tells Moses, speak to the rock and it'll bring forth its waters. But this actually happens two different times. The first time is only two weeks into the journey. 38 years after the journey began is when God tells Moses, speak to the rock that it bring forth its waters. But the first time, God doesn't do that. He tells Moses when the people are thirsting to death and they're actually complaining, after all the miracles they've already seen, he's, they're complaining and they're saying, is God actually among us or not? Now, they just saw the Red Sea parted a couple of weeks before that, and now they think Moses is all washed up because they don't have any water to drink. Now, we know that God says he was doing this to prove them, to see if they would really believe or not. So God tells Moses, take the elders of Israel with you. Take your rod, go out, and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. This was prophetic. Now, clearly, Isaiah writes about this story, as well as David writes about it, and both of them say that Hashem himself, one says was the rock, one says was on the rock. But the rock actually represented Mashiach. And it's fascinating, though, because in both cases, the rock is in two different locations, according to the scripture. But in Hebrew, we say Hatsua. Hatsua means the rock. And so the rabbis conclude it's the same rock. Regardless of what location it is, it's the same rock. And he, they're right. Now, the water that comes from that rock is actually, by many rabbinical scholars, is considered to be the waters of life. It represents the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. God was showing a symbolic thing before the children of Israel. In fact, when Moses smote the rock and the water came forth of the rock, there was something supernatural about this. In fact, I know some of the people that actually discovered that rock in northwest Saudi Arabia. 60 foot tall rock. Penny and Jim Caldwell, as well as Ron Wyatt, and uh, I know a lot of the different people associated with that, Vivka Pontian, that have done a lot of discoveries in uh, northwest Saudi Arabia, where it's believed is the true Mount Sinai. But in that particular rock that Jim and Penny Caldwell uh, have photographed and brought back to the rest of the world, it's a 60-foot tall rock split down the middle but the base of this rock and all the rocks surrounding the area is totally been worn by massive amounts of water. But one of the points that I noticed that there's no hole in this rock. So where did that water come from? No doubt it come from another dimension. And oddly, another thing I find interesting about this, it's like the Garden of Eden talks about the river that came out of Eden and watered the garden that was in Eden. Now how can a river come out of something that's already in something? Unless it's maybe a different dimension. It's like, in other words, that water that was coming out of Eden, the water the garden in Eden, the garden in Eden was just a place within a place. And it was that water that gave the life to Adam and Eve that made everything like a supernatural life in there. We also find this has to be true because we find in the story of Moses and the children of Israel, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. And we have three different occasions, Caleb, Joshua, and Moses that all declare that their strength was not abated a single bit after 40 years of this journey. What was going on? God was giving Israel a type of the water of life. 
what God's life could, would do if you got it on the inside of your soul and not just in your physical body. Because see, as long as the water went into the mouth, it blessed them. But because their heart was not transformed, the heart had not received the waters of life from the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. What came out of the mouth was still defiling them because the heart wasn't converted yet. God was only showing in a natural what he can do in a supernatural. So when Yahshua says to the woman at the well, I will give you water that you don't come here to drink any longer. It's because in that human body called Mashiach, was the waters of life. And he gave her a sign to watch for. Because remember, the whole thing with Moses was prophetic. Take the, take the elders of Israel and go and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. We as Jews are a priestly nation. It's clearly written in the Bible. We're to offer sins for sacrifice. Or excuse me, offer sacrifice for sins. The high priest every year was to enter in to take, and he took uh, uh, two goats. One was called the scapegoat, one was called the sacrificial goat. The scapegoat, had the, he would lay his hands upon him. He would confess the sins of Israel. He'd be taken out with a strong man out to the desert and be released out into the desert while the other one would be sacrificed and killed for the sins of Israel for that year. Isn't that odd? That is so interesting to me. You know why? Because I believe that the, this actually comes from the story of Joseph. Because you see, Joseph in his life, he represents the scapegoat. His brothers were guilty. All but Benjamin, they, he, they, they, he was guilty. They were guilty of, of their brother's disappearance. And he bore in his own body the very iniquity of his brethren. But to try to conceal it, they take his coat. And by the way, in Hebrew, it's the coat of long sleeves. It doesn't say the coat of many colors. I've always wondered where that come from. I don't know. I'm not sure where, where this idea come from. But anyway, they take the coat of Joseph's, and they slay the, a kid of the goats there, and they put the blood upon his coat, and they take it back to his father and said, discern, is this your son's coat or not? And of course, we know the story. Jacob is mourning and weeping. Now, what they did, they meant for, e they meant for evil. Now, I do another teaching on this all together. It's very interesting if you really get into it, like the names, like Reuben. Reuben means behold his son. He's the one that's trying to intercede that they don't kill uh, Joseph, you know, while he's gone. They, he's already been sold out and everything. But, you know, every time they would say the name Reuben, they were saying behold his son, behold his son, behold his son. I mean, come on, well, let's wake up. You know, Simon, Simeon, it means herd. Or, or, you know, hear. You know, it's like hearing, hearing with your ears. When, when they go down and Joseph is revealing himself to his brethren, he, he takes Simeon and he binds him in, in the presence of his brothers there and holds him as a ransom until they bring back Benjamin. Isn't that interesting? Bound him, bind him up, showing that Israel's hearing would be bound for the next 2,000 years. But Joseph, like I said, he bore the sins away from his father's presence. And here we have, in the days we're living in now, the same thing with Yahshua. He played both scapegoat and sacrificial goat both. Now, as I said, though, in the case of Joseph's brothers, they had taken... And what they did, they meant it for evil. But had that goat not been sacrificed and the blood put on his coat, God no doubt accepted that lamb's life for their sins. Though they meant it for evil, he accepted it for their pardoning. Because had he not done that, their sins would have remained on them. And we would be less ten tribes today than what we are. But it's clear that God used that because when they come down later and Joseph says, you know, you, you did this to save life. 
So it's the same thing with, with my brethren today. What we did 2,000 years ago was to complete the mission that God had called us for. As hard as it was to do, we offered up the sacrificial lamb. And if you'll notice, even with Joseph's brethren, look at what they went through as a result. It was very hard. Very hard. In fact, it was two years into the famine before Joseph reveals himself to them. And it's interesting, it's been 2,000 years. So anyway, to make the story short, without going too much longer into this, let me just say this to you. Once he was offered up, once he was on Calvary, once his side, you know, it says he was thrust through. I know there's uh, a lot of argument amongst the, the rabbinical brethren that it's not pierced, it's thrust through. Well, the spear did thrust him through. And I think that's more of the important part. When he was thrust through with the spear and the water and the blood came out and it was separated, that sign that he left with the Samaritan woman was right before her eyes. When the water came out, separated from his blood, it was a sign to Israel that he was that way. That's where the waters of life could be poured out. And it was able to come back upon the believers. That's the true redemption story. That is what makes the way for you and I to receive the Spirit of God. And it's a free gift. No wonder why he breathed upon his apostles after the resurrection and said, Receive ye, receive ye the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He was showing that he was the very one in the Garden of Eden, breathing in the nostrils of Adam. God bless you. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. We love you. We thank you. For those of you guys out there that listen to the ministry on a regular basis, we certainly could use your help in continuing this message, this gospel, to get it out to as many as we possibly can. Baruch Habas.